Hey, I forgot. Um, in the opening, I was going to share with you. My wife, my swell wife, bought me a neat mug. It says, City on a Hill Church. How about that? Is that great? Do I have a wonderful wife or what? Amen. Did I score some points there, honey? Okay. <laughs> hey, have you ever noticed how some people love to envision great dreams about future possibilities? Kind of like Charlie Brown in the cartoon strip. Remember the one where he holds up in his, his hands? He says, these hands may someday do incredible things. These hands may someday accomplish wonderful things. These hands may build bridges. These hands may write soul-stirring novels. These hands might heal the sick. These hands might hit game-winning home runs. These hands may shape the destiny of mankind. And then there are other people like Lucy who looked up at him at that point and said, they've got jelly on them. <laughs> Throughout scripture, there are many people who find, who, excuse me, who God inspires to envision incredible dreams. Nehemiah was one of those individuals. And so today we're gonna to embark on a study of that book that is named after the character of Nehemiah. It's a series I'm calling The Story of a New Beginning. And if you have access to the Word of God, if you brought a copy of scriptures with you today, you can head that direction. If you want to bring it up on your electronic device, that's fine too, although finding a Wi-Fi signal might be a bit of a challenge today, okay? Nehemiah chapter 1 is where we'll drop anchor this morning. So 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, boom, there it is, Nehemiah. If you get to Esther, Job, and all those other people, head back the other direction. I can think of no other book in the Bible that is more relevant to our situation in these days than the book of Nehemiah. And so over these next several weeks, we're going to focus our attention on seven essentials, seven essentials that are absolutely mandatory if we intend to build a major ministry in Wells County and beyond. And so today's essential is that of vision the importance of vision. In order to have a proper understanding of this book, it's imperative that I begin by setting the stage. So allow me to begin today by introducing you to some of the background on this material. I think some of you are aware, probably would be aware, that at the time this book was written, Nehemiah, along with many of his fellow Jews, were actually living in exile. They were in captivity. You see, in 586 B.C., God grew weary of the rebellion and sinfulness of his people. And as a result, he sent a guy by the name of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, into the land of Judah to carry off her possessions and her people. And you can see it there on the screen from 2 Chronicles 36. It tells us that he, Nebuchadnezzar, carried to Babylon all the articles from the temple of God, both large and small, and the treasures of the Lord's temple, the treasures of the kings and his officials, and they set fire to God's temple, and they broke down the wall of Jerusalem, and they burned all the palaces and destroyed everything of value there. Just like God had warned, right? And the Jews who lived through that siege were then bound together they were chained like slaves, and they were transported to Babylon, a trek of more than 800 miles. And so once again, a century, centuries before, they lived in slavery to a foreign power. And yet even so, God did not forget his people. He had a purpose and a plan for his chosen race. In fact, in the 70 years that followed, Babylon herself was overthrown by the combined forces of the Medes and Persians. And interestingly enough, you can see it there, it was under this new administration just as the scriptures had predicted, 2 Chronicles 36, that King Cyrus, a pagan, Cyrus gave permission for the Jews to return to Palestine and to rebuild the temple. And in fact, we know of three specific groups, groups that made that trek home. You can see it there on the screen if you can make it out. The first under the leadership of Zerubbabel, 
Then roughly 60 to 70 years later, there was a second group of Jews that returned to Jerusalem under the guy, under the leadership of a guy by the name of Ezra, and it was under Ezra's leadership that the temple was rebuilt. And then finally, about 12, 13 years later, Nehemiah is going to lead a group back to Judah. And so really, we're, 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 we're at the end of the Old Testament story. Nehemiah is the last historical book. It gives us the closing insight we have into God's people before the arrival of Jesus in the New Testament. Having considered the background of the book, let me just give you a little bit more information on the author. Let's look at the material on the man. If you're looking at Nehemiah 1, you'll see it doesn't record the details of his entire life. In fact, there's virtually nothing written here concerning his early years. The first time we encounter our hero is in chapter 1, verse 11, where you can see it there. I think I highlighted it on the screen for you. He's a cupbearer to the king. A cupbearer. Doesn't sound real glamorous, does it? You probably wouldn't even include that on your resume. Sounds like a burger flipper or maybe a, a pizza delivery guy, right? Ah, but not so fast. The task of a cupbearer was critical. You see, not only did he prevent his boss from being poisoned by tasting the wine before the king drank it and sampling the food before he ate it, but additionally, it was under the practice of this custom that a close relationship typically, uh, typically developed. In fact, ancient historians have suggested that the cupbearer, like no one else other than perhaps the king's wife, was in a position to influence the monarch. Very strategic position. Stop and think about it. The constant threat of assassination often caused a king to lead a very lonely life and so it was only natural then for him to gravitate towards a man of wisdom and discretion and ability. A cupbearer who had the king's interests at heart and who stayed on top of current events could frequently exert great, great influence upon his boss and thus frequently would become an intimate advisor to the king. So I just want you to see today, it's this ordinary guy, right? Not a pastor, not a priest. Nehemiah never went to seminary, didn't have a Bible college degree. He's not a religious paid professional. He's just a dude working a job, a servant, a cupbearer. But Nehemiah is the man whom the Lord raises up to provide leadership for an extraordinary project. There are three realities that I want to call your attention to today. If you're a note taker, I think it'll be pretty easy for you to follow along. Three realities that come right out of this text. The first one is this, the identification of the problem. You see it there on the screen. Nehemiah begins his story by informing us of a visit from his relatives. And we all know what those visits from relatives can be like, don't we? <laughs> Actually, in this case, it was a visit from Nehemiah's brother. Check it out, verse 1 and 2. The words of ne Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, and I, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and about Jerusalem. Remember now, in Nehemiah's day, there was no 24-hour news, no Twitter. No cell phones, no 5G capabilities. Obviously then, news travels very slowly and more often than not by word of mouth, right? And so it was only natural when you met up with travelers from your own home country, it was only natural for you to interrogate them with questions. Questions like, how are things going back home? How, how's the family getting along? What's the stock market doing these days? Who, who, who's playing in the World Series? Nehemiah is intensely interested in their report. But the details I had to share with them were far from encouraging. Because if the truth be told, things back in Palestine were in desperate shape. And verse 3 is actually a short summary of just a few of the details that they shared. 
Nehemiah says, they said to me, those who survived the exile are back in the province and are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. Can you see it there? Basically, their message is, Nehemiah, it's not good. You just aren't going to believe it. In fact, Nehemiah, you need to know it is downright ugly. Now, it might not seem like a big deal to you, but the thing you have to keep in mind here is that cities in the ancient world were walled for protection. And so without a wall of defense to surround the town, no proper stand could be made against their enemies. And for the Jews, that meant then that the recently constructed temple could easily be destroyed. Jerusalem and its inhabitants were still easy pickings for any and every enemy who wanted to attack them. But what I especially want you to pick up on, and this is crucial for our purposes today. Listen to me. When Nehemiah heard that there was a wall broken down in Jerusalem, he identified the problem. But even more than that, he heard an invitation from God to do something about it. He heard heard an invitation from God to get involved. The Lord is saying, Nehemiah, don't just sit there. Do something. Nehemiah, I want you to be the leader in the construction of that wall. Nehemiah, I want you to know that you're my man for the job. You ever notice how some people will just seize the initiative? I mean, they'll just jump right in and get involved. They'll identify a need and and they'll take the required action. And then there's others who respond along the lines of, no one asked me to do anything. Nobody told me it was my responsibility. I didn't even realize there was a problem. Vision has been defined as that compelling conviction which determines where you are headed. It's that tangible expression of purpose which ignites your passion for progress. So you can see that vision by nature has to do with the future, doesn't it? It involves the sights and sounds of tomorrow. It was Bobby Kennedy who paraphrased George Bernard Shaw. He said, there are some people who look at the way things are and ask why. There are others who look at the way things could be and ask, why not? Nehemiah is a man of vision. When he heard the news that the wall around the holy city was in a was in a state of disrepair after 140 years back in the homeland. He didn't ask why, he asked why not. Nehemiah had a great vision of who God is and what God can accomplish through those who are fully devoted to him. So we've considered the identification of the problem. Let's move on to consider reality number two, the implementation of a plan. We've already noted today that The report which fell upon Nehemiah's ears was deeply distressing. The ideal circumstances that he had pictured the Jews in Judah were were unrealistic. The citizens were in danger and with them their faith. But rather than racing to King Artaxerxes' presence and say, I'm out of here, Artie, I'm going to go build a wall. Instead of doing that, you can see it in verse 4, he devises a plan. When I heard these things, when Nehemiah heard the report, look at his reaction. I sat down and wept, and for some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. I want to come back and drill down on that thought next week. But in the meantime, gang, let me ask you this. How many of us are concerned enough about the state of God's work in our day to mourn, fast, and pray over it. We really should be concerned. I could share a lot of stats with you today, but I'm just going to give you a few. Uh, This research is only about two months old. George Barna revealed that 
While 65% of Americans self-identify as Christians, if you ask them, they'll say they're Christians. When it comes right down to it, when it comes to their actual beliefs and behavior, only 6% of American adults possess a biblical worldview. But wait, it actually gets worse than that. His findings also discovered that only 17% Only 17% of Christians who consider their faith important and people who attend church on a regular basis have a biblical worldview. And so what that means is that there's 83% of professing Christians, people who are active believers, people who are attending church, people who are are claiming to follow Christ, 83% who hold to doctrines and beliefs that do not match up with what the Bible teaches. And you're probably wondering, well, Gary, what what kind of beliefs are you talking about here? That's a great question. Thanks for asking it today. Another study conducted by Ligonier Ministries Lifeway Research surveyed evangelical Christians. And so we're surveying believers now. And so, for example, they discovered that 56% of them believe that Jesus is not the only way to God. 73% believe that Jesus is a created being. 43% believe that Jesus is is not God, but just just a good teacher, just a good guy that went around sharing a lot of good thoughts. 60% believe the Holy Spirit is not a personal being, but more of a force. 57% agreed with the statement that everyone sins a little, but most people are basically good when it comes right down to it. Again, these are Christians being surveyed. And I don't know how you react to that, but I would just say, to me, those findings are alarming. The biblical illiteracy and faulty understanding of Orthodox Christian doctrine should deeply disturb us. But the question, of course, is does it? You see, gang, here's the danger. We we can become so accustomed to the brokenness and spiritual bankruptcy that now grips our culture that it no longer breaks our hearts. It just, it just doesn't bother us. It doesn't even come up on our radar screen. Can I ask you, when was the last time you responded like Nehemiah? When was the last time you committed yourself to an extended period of prayer for the mission of the church? When was the last time you missed a meal or meals in order to devote that extra time to intercession? When was the last time that you went out of your way to share the good news of Jesus about somebody who doesn't know him? When was the last time you lost sleep because of work or ministry lay in ruins? When was the last time that you were so burdened for for the Lord's service that you wept before God and then determined to do something about it? I believe those are appropriate questions in light of Nehemiah's response here. Verse 4 tells us that he had a plan. As he went before God in prayer, he had a plan, and it's a plan that he began to implement. Over the next several weeks, we'll discover how he followed through on that implementation. But for now, let's just say we need to follow his example. We need to emulate what he's doing. How did we define vision? The compelling conviction which determines where you're headed. It's that tangible expression of purpose which ignites your passion for progress. So we've considered the identification of the problem and the implementation of a plan. Let's go ahead and we'll wrap things up today by talking about the implications for God's people today. History makes it very clear that the individuals who have been used the greatest by God are the men and women of faith who simply cannot rest when God reveals a ministry need to them. Apparently, Nehemiah was cut out of that kind of mold. One commentator put it like this. I like this statement. He said, Nehemiah created his own crisis by grappling responsibly with a situation, the seriousness of which others either did not recognize or were content to evade. But you see, that's precisely the point. Nehemiah could not. Here was a man that would not be content to sit by and do nothing. 
On the contrary, he took action. He followed through on God's will. And as a result, we'll eventually get there. We'll see that he got the job done. But you know, you stop and think about it. It would have been real easy for Nehemiah just to turn a deaf ear, right? I mean, really, think about it. It would have been real easy for him to resist at this point. It would have been real easy for him to say, come on, God. That silly wall isn't my responsibility. That's... That's 800 miles away. My ministry is here uh, among the pagan royalty. I'm only one person, God. I, I can't possibly do everything. Come on, God. Do these look like the hands of a bricklayer? No. <laughs> You're right, they don't. <laughs> Forget what it's like to have kids in the service. <laughs> I'm going to have to watch out what I ask up here. <laughs> I wonder, gang, I wonder, what would have happened if Billy Graham had never taken action on his vision of crusade evangelism? What if Dawson Trotman had never followed through on his burden for a disciplined program of scripture memorization? What if Bill Bright would have ignored God's call to begin a ministry on the campus of UCLA? What if Chuck Colson would have refused to step through that open door of prison ministry? And I know what you're thinking. You're, you're thinking, Gary, come on. <laughs> come on. Those are all major, hit, major league hitters. Those are, those are huge ministries. I can't possibly relate to those people. My gifts aren't that significant. My abilities are far more limited. All right, that's fair. I'll grant you that. But what about the Sunday school teacher who visited D.L. Moody in a shoe store and led him to Christ? What about the associate pastor who worked alongside of and encouraged Harry Ironside? What about the elderly woman who committed to pray faithfully for Billy Graham's ministry every day for 20 years? What about the individual who financed William Carey's ministry in India? Or the person who taught G. Campbell Morgan his preaching techniques? I could go on and on. Here's the point. There's a whole list of people, and I, we could compile many more, and we wouldn't even know their names. They're basically obscure in, in history. Individuals who, for the most part, had behind-the-scene ministries, and yet the world has felt their impact because they took action. Because they did something about the vision that God had called them to. Why another church in Wells County? Because according to the statistics, a large part of our community remains unchurched. Because a large part of our county is still heading into a Christless eternity. Why another church in Wells County? Because of those stats I mentioned earlier when it comes to the confusion among professing believers as to what the Bible actually teaches. But there's another reason. Earlier I shared that stat, only 17% of Christians who consider their faith important and attend church regularly actually have a biblical worldview. But even more concerning, the fog in the pew can often be attributed to the haze in the pulpit. Again, I'm citing work done by the Cultural Research Center within just the last couple of months. This is an old material. This is brand new. And they tell us that only 37% of Christian pastors have a biblical worldview. And so, for example, one-third or more of senior pastors believe that determining moral truth is up to each individual. There are no moral absolutes that apply to everyone at all time. One third or more of pastors believe that. One third or more believe that the Holy Spirit is not a living entity but is a symbol of God's power, presence, or purity. One third or more believe that having faith matters more than what faith you have so, in other words, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere about what you believe. It doesn't really matter. 
One third or more of senior pastors believe that reincarnation is a real possibility. One third or more of senior pastors believe that a person who is generally good or does enough good things for others can earn a place in heaven. One third or more believe that the Bible is ambiguous in its teaching when it comes to the sanctity of human life. And I could go on and on and on. And again, I don't know how you react to that news today, but I find those stats deeply disturbing. And it's those kind of stats that motivate me to get involved, that motivate me to engage that motivate me to do what I can in my small corner of the world. Many of you in this room would be aware that I took a step back from full-time ministry about a year and a half ago. And the reason for that isn't hard to figure out. At 67 years of age, I was operating at an unsustainable pace. I just wasn't gonna be able to do it much longer without something happening. And in the time that's transpired since then, I've come to the conclusion that I still have some fire left in the tank. I enjoy pe preaching and teaching. It's one of the things I enjoy most about ministry. And I wanna be a good steward of that which God has entrusted to me. When I stand before him on that day, I wanna know that I did what I could. And I used the energy and the abilities that I had and the appeal to this type of ministry was starting something simple and basic. And you're going to hear those words repeatedly. Simple and basic. It would primarily involve a Sunday morning focus. And so I'm, I'm, just, I'm telling you up front today that I'm not interested in starting a megachurch. All right? We, we've done that type of ministry for over 40 years, and that's great, but that's not my heart today. I'm interested in a major ministry and a modest facility. And if you look around you today, you'll see that it doesn't get much more modest than this, okay? The bathrooms are downstairs, for example. I forgot to tell you that, okay? <laughs> And in full transparency, just being open and honest, I will also tell you that we're not sure how things are going to play out in this location. I've already mentioned to you that the Sturms have been very gracious in making this building available to us. We can rent it at an incredibly reasonable price. And we do have opportunity to buy adjacent land. In fact, those plans are in the works. We have the ability to buy land that we can use for parking. But we're waiting on a survey. We're waiting on the county to give us a survey before we can actually put the gravel down to make that a reality. And I can't tell you for sure. There's, there's no guarantee that that will materialize. I can't promise that that'll happen. We simply just don't know at this point. So again, speaking very honestly today, this whole thing could go belly up. It could. But the way that we're looking at it is that it's a low risk, potentially high yield possibility. The risk is low, the potential for high yield, very real. And we are simply like Nehemiah, trying to be obedient to a call that we sense that God has placed before us. Just, it's as simple as that. We will continue to step out as God opens the doors and we're going to leave the results in his hands. Helen Keller was once asked this question. She, she was asked, what would be worse than being born blind? And her reply was, to have sight without vision. So as I wrap up this morning, I'm asking you, what do you see? No, what do you see? What kind of vision has God given you for these days? 
I'll tell you what I see. I believe the hour is late. I believe we're living in critical times. And I believe there's an urgency to engage and be about those things that will matter for eternity. And I'm just crazy enough to believe that a small committed group of believers in the middle of a cornfield can still have a significant impact on our world for Christ. Now I want you to listen real carefully to what I'm about to say. This is important. I want you to hear me clearly. The churches that currently exist in Wells County are not our competition. Nor are the people who are currently plugged into those congregations our target audience. And so just as I've asked our core group, I'll ask those of you who are in attendance today, please don't invite people who are currently plugged into a local church. If they're happy and content and growing and thriving, then you leave them right there. That's not our target audience. Our competition is the kingdom of darkness. Our competition is, is the enemy who has blinded the eyes of countless individuals who, if we don't do something to intervene, they are headed into that Christless eternity. Our target audience are those who have soured on the church or perhaps never seriously entertained the good news of Jesus. Instead of asking why, I'd rather ask, why not? Why not? And I believe that many of you are here today because you fall into that same category. You're excited. You're looking for a fresh start. You're looking for a new beginning. And you're dreaming about those same kind of possibilities with me. To those of you who fall into that category, I say, welcome aboard. Here's your assignment, you ready? If you don't write it down, at least make a mental note. Here's your homework assignment for this coming week. Let's begin by praying. God, give us eyes for the harvest. God, give us the kind of vision that sees the possibilities for the ministry that exists all around us. Jesus challenged his first century disciples. You see it there, John 4, 35. Open your eyes and look on the fields. They are ripe for harvest. And so what a, how, how fantastic that all we have to do is walk outside these doors, right? And we literally see that all around us, that the fields are ripe for harvest. But Jesus here, of course, is talking about a spiritual harvest, isn't he? So let's begin by praying, God, give us eyes for the harvest. Give us a vision for possibilities for ministry. It's an old song. It's been around forever, but the lyrics fit so well today. It goes like this. See the fields ripe and white as snow. Up from the seeds of faith we planted long ago. So many the hearts in season. With every prayer they grow, he has made them ready. But we must bring them home. Time like a free wind so quickly slips away, too soon today's tomorrow, too soon a yesterday, so little time for reaping, and laborers are few. Lift your heads, the fields are, are white, the work that we must do. And then that prayer, Lord of the harvest, place your fire in me. Servant you need now, a servant I will be. Give me the eyes of your spirit, your heart of compassion to know wherever you lead me. Lord of the harvest. I'll go. God, wherever you lead, whatever time you give, whatever ministry you call me to, I'll go. Vision by its very nature leads to action. And just like Nehemiah, we're called to be men and women of vision, men and women of faith, men and women of action, men and women who will take the necessary steps to carry out God's will. That's the challenge I leave you with today. How about we stand for closing prayer?
Lord of the harvest, ignite your fire in our hearts. Lord, call those out that, that, that you have designed and, and, and designated for ministry, that, that we would respond, that we would hear very clearly that just like Nehemiah, we're just an ordinary guy. And we might not have a whole lot to offer, but when we place it at your disposal, when we lay it at your feet, or just like those loaves and fish, you can multiply, multiply, you can, you can increase, and so the masses are fed. God, all around us today, we're aware that there, there's hurting, broken people that desperately need to know Jesus and desperately, desperately need to encounter Christ. And Lord, we just want to be obedient. We're not thinking in terms of being sensational. We're not thinking in terms of doing anything out of the ordinary. We just want to be responsive servants that hear your call and say, I'm going to act on that. I'm going to do what, what God has called me to do. And what I have might be meager, but I believe that God can take it and use it in a mighty way to expand this kingdom. Lord, I don't know what you're doing with hearts today. I don't know what kind of fire flame you're igniting, but I, play that, I just pray that a match would be struck. And initially, it might be very small thing, but Lord, we know that your, your Holy Spirit can kindle that thing in such a way that it takes off and becomes a bonfire. And, and, and the kind of light, Lord, that will, will shine out from this hill in, in the lives of your people in such a way that others who don't know you are drawn to Christ. I'm going to learn what it means to have a relationship with you. So God, we just place ourselves at your disposal today. And our prayer as we conclude would be, give us your vision. Give us your ability to see what you're calling us to in these days. And then help us, God, to be faithful and responsive to that vision. Thanks, Jesus. Thanks for being with us here today. We commit ourselves to that end. We pray in Christ's name. And everybody who agreed said, Amen. Amen. God bless. Amen.